Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Author Reality Show. Although I think my co-host Brandy calls it a different show, but this was her idea, so therefore Brandy can call it whatever she'd like. I think we should tell everyone how this show got started. Brandy, tell them a bit about what they can expect in this show. When I first had this idea, it was 40 days for 40 writers writing over 40 days to finish, polish, and pitch their books to publishers who would then compete Shark Tank style for the rights to publish those works. That was the original concept. It was a little unwieldy. And the first time I tried nine years ago to crowdfund it, I fell flat on my face. Nobody wanted to fund it. I tried again the next year. Nobody wanted to fund it. I made $10, but that's the year I met Wilma and then Jade. <laughs> They were the first people to get on board with my vision and say, let's do this thing. Let's make this a reality. We progressed over the years from my original plan, which was going to take $2.5 million to do, to a stripped down version that's only going to take four weeks, four writers, and zero dollar budget. So. <laughs> That's what we'd be like to do it. Apparently there's also a jade. I have a jade to my left that no one can really see. Yes. Absolutely. Because it's audio. Jade, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jade. I'm the uh, other half, the boring half of Wilnona. There we go. Not boring. There's <laughs> and I'm Wilnona Marie, one half of the and I thought ladies. So this show, as Brandy said, is four weeks, four writers. And each week, oh, every other week, I guess we could say at this point, one of them loses their spot at getting a traditionally published contractor. Contractor. Mm. I contractor. just said contractor. That's going to so get edited in the end. <laughs> oh, no, wow. Not. So <laughs> I think without any further ado, we should probably meet the brave souls that have volunteered. No guns to any heads, by the way. They just <laughs> volunteered to put their work into the world for us to hear and for these four publishers to hear. Let's start off with Wolf O'Rook, who vaguely remembers being a member of MIB. He thinks a neuralizer went off and he forgot his sunglasses. So therefore he's haunted by his time protecting the earth from harmful celestials. And he has contented himself with writing series like my Zaza, Zazatra series and his cyber thriller series. And yes, I messed up his first series, but Wolf, I think you can handle that problem of correcting me <laughs> and getting it right. Tell us a bit about us yourself and why you're here. I'm sorry, what was the first part? <laughs> can you tell us a bit about yourself and why you're here oh, today? Okay, sorry. Yeah, so as I said, uh, I, I think I used to work for MIB. I, I am not quite sure about that. But, you know, I have all these ideas about cyber security and finance and politics floating around in my head that somebody probably implanted some agency. So I just have to get them out. Otherwise, my head will explode. There's just too many stories in there. I've been doing this, I think, since sixth grade. They kind of erased that part, too. But I also back then put out a newsletter with funny stories. So uh, when you in this area, in the thriller area that is based on mystery and suspense and all kinds of secrets, it gets kind of all hazy. Yeah. Okay. Can you tell us a bit about what you hope to get out of this journey? Uh, you didn't mention that part in my bio. I'm a member of multiple writers groups and I read for critique regularly. Feedback is important to me. My idea which is titled 100, contains a lot of controversial subjects. And to have industry people validate that the story is worth publishing is really important to me. Thank you so much, Will, for taking a chance and taking a shot at that contract. Our next contestant will be... Lisa Tolles. Lisa Tolles is an award-winning Amazon best-selling crime novelist and a passionate speaker. She has titles like Terrier Bay under her belt, as well as her first two books for her ENA Invest investigation series. She hit number one in Amazon Kindle's bestsellers. So 
Lisa, can you tell us what you hope to get from this journey and a bit about yourself? I'm sure that your bio didn't even start to begin to talk about everything that you do. Thank you, Will Nona. I'm super excited to be here. This is a wonderful challenge for me. My 11th thriller, Terror Bay, will be released in November of this year. I write fast-paced, high-concept action thrillers through the eyes of obsessive protagonists willing to uncover truths and find justice at any cost. I mean, they're all different. I do have one series, but um, they're all kind of just separate um, separate individual standalone thrillers. And I'm excited to be here today because the process of thinking about the answers to the questions that you brought is helping me deepen my knowledge of what this story is, of what these themes are, and why would people care about them? Why would readers care about these? What's the potential impact um, to the themes in this book, and how how is that universal among, among readers? So I always want to get closer to my readers, and like Wolf was saying, I want to get closer to them and understand what they want from me using that feedback, and so I think this will be a great learning experience for me, and if by chance I'm selected, then I love the idea of talking about a publishing contract to bring this unique story to a wider audience. So thank you. Thank you. I love your answers to all those questions, by the way. I sound like, if I'm hearing this correctly, that Wolf and our next contestant, Lisa, are going to be head to head on this one. <laughs> we'll see. All right, I'm looking forward to a little competitiveness on this. I'm kind of excited. Our next contestant is John R. Kelly, and he is a brand new writer to the scene. Therefore, I'm going to let him introduce himself and tell us what he hopes to get about this writing journey and a little bit about the challenges he's already facing starting a new book. Any of your novice authors out here, this is your guy. Thank you very much. I love to write. It's been something I've done for most of my life, just scribbles and whatnot. Writing the novel itself, it's taken me years. I really want to help people more than anything. I'm an attorney by trade. You can help people one case at a time doing that. All of my writing comes from some of its personal experiences, from stories I've heard from other people. The work I'm working on is kind of a dystopian. That's just the way I see the world, and I just want to help people who are suffering. I read far too many newspapers to know about it. I hope to help people with my writing who might otherwise be a little too busy or, or whatnot to notice some of the things that may be able to help society. So that's really why I write. This experience is fantastic. You write literary agents, and you get tons of rejection letters and everything. So to have this is just great. It's just a really really wonderful opportunity that I'm grateful for. Last but not least, I think I might have saved the best for last. We're going to stay in the professional grade right here. We're going to go from a lawyer to a doctor because, you know, something every family wants, the lawyer, the doctor, and the reigning monarch or something. I don't know if the reigning monarch ever really happens in someone's family, but whatever. Dr. Michael Nelson he was a small town physician. In his first three novels, he detailed his life from the projects of inner city Chicago to the Vietnam War and the emotional and psychological burdens those experiences brought to him. Oh my goodness, it is so great to have your experiences here with us today to bring to literature. Dr. Michael Nelson, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us what you hope to get from this journey. I don't know who you were just talking about because that <laughs> doesn't sound anything like me at all. And these other people are pretty awesome. And I actually am a little bit humbled to be included in this group. I didn't write my first book until I was 68 years old. It was only after I was forced to retire that I thought I should try to write some of the stories that I had lived through before I'd finally gotten around to having children. The first three books that I wrote were kind of dark, anti-hero biographies of my life. They were easy to write about because I lived through a lot of it, most of it, some of it. The, the guy made himself sound pretty good. The last two books, and, and to be honest with you, I just finished my fifth book last week and sent it in to the publisher. When I finished the first three books, I said I was done. I didn't fancy myself being a writer. I always joke that my books are the greatest books never read. I figured I was done. My daughter said, no, you've got to keep writing, Dad. And I said, I'll tell you what. You give me the subject and I'll write about it, but you got to do the research. So the last two books are young adult 
fantasy with magic and witches and all kinds of things like that. My daughter's name is on the cover as well. So she gets the praise for it too. So I was pretty excited about this tonight. I thought I was kind of empty there after finishing the last book and, oh, you know, I want to take a break, put my brain on vacation and stuff like that. Now, all of a sudden, I have to come up with an outline that impresses you or at least doesn't disappoint me. It's kind of kickstarted me all over again. I'm excited to be here, but I got to tell you, I'm humbled to be around the rest of you people. I want to thank all of the contestants for being here today. I'm hoping I'm not being too overexcited because I am so excited about all of y'all stories and all of the potential outlines that are going to come out of this. Brandy, my lovely, wonderful co-host who came up with this idea, can you tell our contestants what their challenge is for the first week? Absolutely. Your challenge tonight is to complete a single page synopsis of your book so that we can hear what you've got going on for your concept. You will be judged on that. You will not be eliminated this week, but whoever is the weakest will be given a warning before you move on to the next stage. Thank you. And you have 10 minutes on the clock right now to get started on that outline. Good luck. Contestants, I do recommend you take off your headphones and set your timer so that you know when it's done so that you're not distracted by what we're going to be discussing. All that said, I wanted to just barge in and be like, hey, hey, how do you feel what you're doing? <laughs> that, I feel like it adds more of a challenge, Brady, don't you? <laughs> so we've got to know all of our contestants. I'm going to go ahead and start with our judges. For tonight, we'll start with Stephanie Lark. Larkin from Red Penguin Press. Stephanie Larkin is the founder and president of Red Penguin Books and Web Solutions, and her company has been around for over a decade. It's so great to have you here. Not to mention that your press also has the word penguin in it. Every time I hear it, I'm like, I see a penguin in a red dress with some heels and a little lipstick going out. Stephanie. Do you oh, want to be really excited about that penguin with the lipstick? Believe me. Um, <laughs> when you first told me you were thinking about a reality show, how fast did I say yes to you? Should I like jump all over that? Because yeah, like I don't even think you added the question mark to the end, and she was like, "Yes." <laughs> I mean, like seriously, as a publisher, every day feels a little like a reality show. So, so you're just making it formalized. I love that. I love the format. I love that we're going to get a little peek. So often when people come to me for publishing, they're kind of already like past the stage that we're at now. I get to kind of look back and see what they were thinking about before they would have even made it to me, which is really kind of cool. I love that. You know, all these challenges that you're going to have each week, it puts me backwards because usually I wouldn't even get called or get a query until further along. So I love diving in. I think it was Lisa who mentioned that she loves the idea of the challenges to get better into the reader's mind. Well, I love them to get better into the author's mind. So I'm thinking that this is a really cool way of kind of understanding authors. So thanks for having me. And of course I have to wear red. Red penguin, red, red, always red, you got it. <laughs> Stephanie, what do you think that you'll be looking for in the outlines tonight to really give you a taste of like what the book is going to be about? Yeah, I think outlines are rough. I always say to my own authors, that thing that goes on the back of your book, the Amazon description, probably the hardest thing you're going to write. You can write 70,000 words, but when you have to write just 250, woof, that's rough. And now that they know that we're judging them, we're reading those and we're literally judging about it. That's pressure. You know what? That's why I said, I tell my own authors with their own outlines, show it to a lot of people. The key, I think, is to get us excited, tell us enough that we want to read the book, but not too much that we feel like, yeah, don't have to read the book now. 
Love that. I love that. A nice balance. I just thought that, you know, a lot of these writers right now, they have skills with a pen, but this is also going to require someone to have skills as an orator or as, as a reader, because we're not reading them on a piece of paper. They're reading them to us. So you got to put some oomph in there. Brandy, have you thought of any skills that these writers would also need tonight? I think one of the most important things is the ability to balance your focus on doing the job with an awareness of who's reading it and how you can bring them excitement about the content you're creating. Thank you, Stephanie from Red Penguin Press. I thoroughly have enjoyed your input on this and I'm looking forward to seeing, to hearing your deliberations later on in the show about this. Go ahead and introduce Rose Drew. Rose is a public speaker, editor, and book publisher. She's also an events manager. Hey, did I mention she did a TED Talk? She has co-hosted the York Spoken Word and Poetry Prose Open Mic since January 2016. Rose, before we even get started on you introducing yourself, can you tell us what time it is and where you are? Ah, I'm in York, England. Right now, it is 12.30. It's, it's after midnight. We've been running the poetry, the York Spoken Word Poetry and Prose Open Mic since January 2006. We started it almost 18 years ago. It's been running every single month, month in and month out. We just started it and forgot to stop. And it's just been going along. People have come in and grown old and died. <laughs> it's just crazy. We've got people as young as nine and 10 that come in and read. We do. We've had kids come in. We've had teens come in and stay a while. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. One kid was in, went off to university, came back, got married, has had kids. And she's still coming from time to time. It's pretty funny. It makes me feel a little old, <clears throat> sort of. We've been doing that and book publishing for about the same amount of time, 17 or 18 years. So what does stairwell books normally look for in a book? And as Stephanie has said, this is a peek backwards into time. What does stairwell books normally look for as a finished product? When someone sends me a manuscript, I have to have a story that I literally cannot put down, that I can't stop thinking about, that haunts me, that I walk around during the day and I go, have I seen that? Is that a film? Oh my goodness, no, it's the manuscript I've been reading. It makes me wonder about the characters, even the minor ones. I wonder what the rest of their life is doing because we're only seeing a slice of life in this story. It really has to be so engaging that I just I can't stop thinking about it. What I say to my interns are, would you spend your last 10 or 15 or $20? Would you spend your last 10 quid on this? Not forever, but for this month, would you spend your last little bit of money on this? If they go, I don't know, we might give it a pass. But if they go, yeah, oh yeah, I'd buy this book. I'd buy this book in the store. Then we go forward with the project and we really take it seriously. What are you expecting for them outlines tonight since this is the beginning? What am I looking for in the outline? To be honest, I don't always read the synopsis. I d actually don't because when you're in Waterstones or, or wherever, you know, you look at the book, you look at the front, you look at the back cover, that little tiny bit. But if I'm really curious, I just want to get into the story. I want to see if I'm captured in that first couple of pages. For synopsis, I do want to have a sense that they are in control of the story that they know what's happening. I don't want to see too many moving parts because I've seen synopses where it's just like planets. So you're in a spaceship and they're just going past you. I don't want to see too much crazy information that you can't follow the thread. I do want to see a coherent thought process and what's going on. And again, having even that grab me because I'm like, all right, so, okay, it's about her. And then she goes, uh-huh. But if it's this happens and we're going to do this and that's probably going to happen, we're going to find that part out. Then let me take a backward step here. I like how you said that. You literally melted down what you would expect from a manuscript and were like, hey, give me the bare bones and make it organized in 10 minutes. Our next person is going to be KMA Sullivan is the founder and publisher of Yes, Yes Books and author of two poetry collections, Necessary Fire from Black Lawrence Press and Inclined to the Riot from Sibling Rivalry Press. KMA, can you tell us a bit about you yourself? and what you're expecting from these outlines tonight. Sure, thank you so much for including me in this fun and hopefully useful conversation for folks. I'm not sure there's too much interesting other that I can say about myself. You got the highlights there. I'll go right to what I'm looking for in a synopsis. The Yes Yes is predominantly a poetry press, though we have been stepping into fiction the last couple of years, and I am looking for additional fiction titles. Because we're predominantly a poetry press, I would say that I'm interested in language above plot 
that makes it a little tricky. There's plenty of brilliant fiction work out there that the language is privileged above plot. So I'm hoping in the synopsis to see a little bit of the language, to hear a little bit of the voice that would be showing up. That is what's most engaging when I'm reading fiction. That's a little bit hard to get into a synopsis. I also love plot. I also love story. I love character. But I would say for me personally, I'll be listening for some language that engages me, that is condensed, that is maybe multi-layered, because of course that's what I'm looking for in poetry as well. I'm reading for that. And just a sense of voice. I don't just want to be told things. I want to feel them. I want to hear them. I want to hear the character through the, the language and not just be told what the characters are or who they are internally. And then the other thing I'm looking for always, always when I'm reading for fiction and also poetry is for the truth and complexity of the human experience. I'm not interested in work that flattens that out. Life is messy. Human beings are complicated. I really look for work that stays true to that, that reflects the truth of that complexity. All right. Thank you so much. And last but not least is Deborah Franklin. Deborah, I know you are a wordsmith in your shop at all times with words every time you speak. She's the CEO of Church Girl Press. Tell us a bit about you and what you're looking for in the outlines tonight. Hello, everybody. I'm so excited about being here, y'all. I am that person. I am the founder of Church Girl CEO Magazine and Deborah Franklin Publishing. That's how we want to roll in with that. I work with people to tell their stories, but also I usually work in the self-help genre. And so with that being said, I also like to work with authors on how they are coming across in the media. As a media coach, I'm going to be listening for them and how they express themselves. The age of authors just hiding behind their books, hiding behind a podcast, hiding behind everything except because people want to see you. They want to hear you. They want to see the smile on your face. They want to see how you interact with everybody. That's what I'm going to be looking for. I want to see how excited are you about your work? Because at the end of the day, even if your outline sucks, I'm just going to be real. You, I want to see, are you excited about what you wrote down? <laughs> are you excited about these characters? Are you excited about the plot? Are you excited about the setting? Are you just excited, period? Being able to sell yourself and what you're doing, because that's the only way we know we got to market ourselves. We have to sell ourselves. And if people are not going to, if they don't feel comfortable around you, you can kind of hang it up. That's it for me. I hope I summed that up. I think I did it real quick. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Did you not bring some energy to this tonight? <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. And for all of our contestants out there tonight, pin down, that's time. All right. Now that everyone is back in the studio and back on, it is time to meet our guest judges. Each week, we will have a guest judge that is familiar with what we're talking about. This week, we have people who are familiar with writing, number one, and someone familiar with publishing. We have Pat Valdada, who is a novelist and poet and currently working on her fourth novel. She's a retired teacher of English and creative writing and has judged contests in her past. I'm going to say, y'all, I feel like she's throwing in the literary weight there. That's our literary judge to win tonight. <laughs> And then we also have Miss Joy Lynn Ross. I'm going to go ahead and let my co-host, who has been as quiet as a mouse here, go ahead and introduce Miss Joy Lynn Ross because they know each other well. Yes, we do, actually. It is thanks to the ladies that Joy Lynn and I met. She is a national best-selling author. She sold 12,500 of her self-published third book, landing her a book deal in six figures. She's well and able to judge literary quality. She's worked as an editor in both traditional publishing, and she has a publishing services company called Path to Publishing. She is the CEO and founder. Welcome aboard, Ms. Joylyn M. Ross. Thank you so much. Thank you. I am so excited to be here. Okay, so first and foremost, because, you know, I'm a stickler for words, pun intended. We're talking about my here, working as an acquisitions editor for 10 years. That's kind of like the full course meal. The synopsis is the appetizer. I'm not sure what I'm getting here tonight, but I think I'm getting the synopsis. 
because I'm here and I'm here a synopsis. So I'm ready for it all though. Like I came with an empty stomach. Like if y'all hear that noise, if I have to go on mute, that's my stomach growling. Okay. It's the stomach. I am here for it all, but let me just tell you what I look for in a book as a reader. Yes, I am a literary industry professional, but when I'm writing down the books here, the 5, 10 to 15, 20 or whatever, reader hat on. I don't care how great your book is. I don't care how great the author is. I don't care how great the character is. All I care about is the great things your book is going to do for me. The reader, what is your book going to do for me? That's what I want to hear. I do want to hear that I did. It's a great book, but at the end of the day, it's the reader you have to sell. It's the reader you have to sell, regardless of which path to publishing you choose. <laughs> Again, pun intended. You have to make sure the reader knows and what you're sharing with them. What are the great things this book is going to do for the reader? This goes for fiction writers, nonfiction, your memoir, your self-help, your children's book. I want to hear what are the great things your book is going to do for me, the reader, who's laying down the books. Boom, let's get it, let's go. <laughs> Pat, will you tell us what you're looking for in the more uh, literary side of the world? I'm not very literary when it comes to reading. I like mysteries and good romance and Lord of the Rings and all kinds of stuff. The main thing I'm looking for are good characters, people I want to spend time with because life is too short to be with people you don't like. For me, it's all about who are these people, who are these characters, what are their desires, what's getting in their way of things, and how are they going to work their way through that. I want to go with them on their journey and see how well they do. For me, it's the people in the book. That's what matters. I think this is a wonderful time right now to... I feel like the pressure's on. Thank you, Jade. The pressure's on. All of our contestants, I don't think none of them heard what the judges are looking for. They have all heard what the guest judges are looking for. I give you one more second to look at that outline before you present it. I'm going to have Brandy go ahead and remind us what is on the line at, at the end, what these people will win in the end of four weeks, if they can make their case for having a book. At the end of the four weeks, they are going to be pitching their books to publishers. So these first three weeks, these first three episodes are all about them preparing to pitch to the publisher. And then on the fourth week, if they make it all the way through the rounds, they get to sit in front of the publishers and get a traditional publishing contract. That's what's at stake. All of our contestants are reminded of what's at stake. You've had another moment to look at that outline. Brandy, it's your show. It was your idea. Go for it, Brandy. All right. Well, I'm going to pick on Wolf. Since I'm a thriller writer, I normally use a fairly complex outline, which is a mix of, say, the cat and Edson to, to get all the plots straight. But since the requirement is one page, I basically summarize a, a synopsis quasi. So the title is 100. By 2092, poison food supplied by women has wiped out most men. Government controls allow one male consort for every hundred females, enough to provide sperm and some companionship. Self-centered 15-year-old Calvin Carlyle's poor grades and lack of respect for women take him from Beverly Hills to re-education as a proper consort. While a young guard attracts his attention, he himself becomes the object of desire of one of the cynical employees conspiring to sell books, boys into slavery in a foreign country. Although torn between the lure of big money, his new love, and his yearning for freedom and family, Calvin colludes with three other boys to escape the fortress-like school. With men heavily regulated, violence, crime, and warfare have dropped to unprecedented unprecedented levels. Intending to keep the peace and prosperity achieved at a staggering price, government officials resort to harsh measures to squelch deviant behavior, including a shadowy free army of men fighting to overthrow the repression. Calvin's celebrity actor's mother, mother, Catherine, pays dearly in jail for trying to prevent her son's arrest. To make an example of her, the warden tries to railroad her into confessing. 
Instead, a mother convicted of an accidental death protects Calvin Catherine from the various racist gangs that dominate prison life. She emerges stronger and wiser from a corrupt legal system, determined to free her son no matter the cost. While the Carlisle family struggles to reclaim their lives, the country comes under assault. After decades of world peace, the president of the Federation of North America discovers that the South American Bolivar bloc is secretly raising a male army. In a surprise move, Bolivar invades Panama and Costa Rica. The army of men use extreme violence to intimidate the female Federation forces, which retreat. In desperation, the chairwoman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff agrees to unleash the president's secret weapon, an army of trained extras from a movie. Despite numerous setbacks, mother and son persist on their separate paths towards their common goal. Catherine goes beyond herself. Calvin, in his quest to outwit the system, learns the value of love and friendship. In the end, their efforts help win the war, his freedom, and better lives for men worldwide. Wolf, I'm not sure if you hate women, love men, hate men, or love women from this book, but it's an interesting book to me. But then again, I have no weight in this. Brandy, any of your thoughts? It's a very interesting premise and something that it would be interesting to read to see how it plays out. That's what the hosts think, but uh, we don't get to weigh in on this. So it's not our vote. Let's go ahead and have our judges tell us what you think about this, what you think should be added, taken away, what you think in general. Guest judges are included in this. Just jump in. Mm. It's an interesting turnaround from The Handmaid's Tale, if you will. Then again, somehow the focus ends up right back on men. Mm. I would agree with that because, I mean, the mother-son um, situation, I think, is uh, as there's a lot of interesting possibility there. But the, but I was distracted at the beginning mm. with the one male consort for every hundred females. Now, if I'm doing the math correctly, right. let's say a man services three women a day. That's a lot. Um, but that means that the women get to have sex once a month. No, mm -mm, no. I mean, that's not that doesn't work for me at all. And and it also would increase the value of men beyond imagining, which would run counter to the idea that the women have poisoned most of the men. So, Wolf, well, I would actually say that the that the opening premise needs to be adjusted, and if you know, and, and that you do need to decide. I agree with Rose that you need to decide you know, what are you shooting for here? Are, are you shooting for a society that values men well above women or values mm -hmm. women well above men? Um, and, and in a sense, that's, that seems possibly secondary to the mother-son adventure and, and challenge. Where are the lesbians? I mean, we're and assuming indeed, it's a very indeed. heteronormative sort of <laughs> tale, to be honest. Would any of the guest judges like to jump in as well? Boy, am I glad there are some judges doing the math on this. I'm really <laughs> glad about that. I, 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 I was not sitting there with my calculator, but now that you put it like that, yeah, up, I got man? some serious problems with that. <laughs> I'm oh. with you. The mother and son concept, great concept. I want to hear more in the description that makes me tug at the heartstrings. I didn't leave it rooting for anyone. You know what I mean? I didn't really, yes. you know, feel that the tang of what I really wanted to happen. But I'm loving your view on it. And where the lesbians question is a biggie. Uh, Wolf, I have to say great work for 10 minutes. I'm amazed that you got it all done. It's Deborah, Pat, or Joy Lynn who, with the last word on this. Then we're moving to the next one. I'll go. I think I have to agree with my fellow sisters that have already gone. The whole mother-son, is this going to be kind of like an Oedipus complex? What are we doing? I would want to know more about that in the development. I know y'all only had 10 minutes, but how did we get to this point? Why are we killing all the people? And yes, I'm glad you did the math. I definitely want to hear more. Wolf, I apologize. I just recognize all my judges are CEOs that are female. So... <laughs> 
<laughs> All the judges are CEOs that are female. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> Wolf, would you like to tell us a bit more about the mother son thing? And so that's what they have it to think about because everyone has asked. I was debating opening with the son because almost the entire story is about his and her journey. The society and the war are the backdrop. It's kind of war and peace. Many of the issues that were brought up are actually not the focus of the story. I should have opened with a hook instead of the setup, which, it, again, I debated that. Basically, the details are that the men were poisoned by a female oligarch whose husband and father were killed by repressive male governments. She just did it out of revenge. We're ending up, the, the, the number on average is about 50 to 1, but we ended up with that because of her. That's just the reality at the moment. It's not like the other women had a voice in this. Wolf, thank you so much for that clarification. Brandy, next selection and our guest judges are starting off on their opinion on the next one. All right, Miss Lisa, let's hear from you. I'm excited. Okay, thank you, everyone. Wolf, I thought your synopsis was great and really polished. That's really what you'd see on the back of a book. I'm not there yet with this novel. What I did is I created kind of a beat sheet with acts one, two, and three to sort of show the lineage of the story. So Thea Riggs, my main character, is a 17-year-old mixed race, Latino and Pacific Islander. She just graduated from high school and she's not yet come to terms with her sexuality as a lesbian. So that's a really important transformative theme of this book and why I call it a young adult coming of age thriller. On this thriller that's called Specimen, it's 86,000 words, high concept, that takes place in San Francisco. And Thea is a real life superhero disguised as this insecure pre-college teen who investigates a series of murders and takes down a nefarious global syndicate. I say high concept because this book's themes are corruption, gaming, whistleblowing, genetic engineering, and secret societies. They would attract readers who love secrets, puzzles, and corruptions. The Hook, I would say the summer after high school graduation, 17-year-old Thea Riggs investigates the suspicious death of her best friend's mother and becomes the subject of an internet game and the center of a global conspiracy. The inciting incident is that Thea is summoned to her best friend's house. The friend is not there. The house is empty and her best friend's mother is dead on the kitchen floor. And the first plot point is before escaping from the house, Somehow Thea feels compelled to snap a picture of the dead body. The cameras in the house record this, and now the killer knows that she not only saw the body, but has photographic evidence of it, and now she's just become his next target. So in act two, we have a number of pinch points showing inner conflict and opposition. The first one is police exposure. Thea is questioned by the police in connection with the dead woman, but she can't talk to the police about it without putting herself in even more danger. In the mint point, Thea discovers a connection between the dead woman and what's called the Edgar Heights killings, a series of unsolved murders from 15 years ago. Thea then learns of a viral internet game called Dead Seven. So internet game, like, I don't know, some of you might remember Chiquita 3301, an internet game called Dead Sevens with a connection to the dead body that she found. She also realizes that her pursuer put a tracking device on her phone and all of her movements are being recorded in the internet game online. So now she has even more exposure, which is the last thing she wants. On the run and hiding from the police, Thea and a new ally frantically work to connect these dots, uncovering the game's connection to not only the woman who died, but a global syndicate with a nefarious agenda. The crisis of the book involves Thea's ally is killed in the process, and this sort of awakens something new in her. I mean, she's like, oh my God, this is war. She suddenly has more of a moral imperative to find justice. This new Thea has developed a connection between the dead woman, the dead sevens game, the unsolved Edgar Heights killings, and this syndicate that she thinks is behind all of it. 
more importantly, she's identified one of their operatives who she forces to share their ultimate agenda. So in the climax, using herself as bait, she agrees to be taken by the syndicate in one of their genetic experiments to see the truth of what they're doing, showing the depth of her desperation and her commitment to the truth. And the resolution is Thea goes with her mother back to the Marshall Islands and comes to terms with not only her sexuality, but parts of her family and her past that she had been hiding from. So really the strength and the fortitude that Thea managed to pull out of herself through this investigation gives her the courage to get to the next step in her own personal evolution. For her, this means coming out to her mother. I mean, she has friends and advisors that tell her, you're not out as a gay person unless you tell your mother. She's the closest person to you in the world. You have to do that as validation that you've come to terms with a self-awareness as this. She comes out to her mother and also feeling confident enough to acknowledge her sexuality as a lesbian. And the story also exposes Thea's love of criminal investigation and justice where she decides to major in criminal justice when she goes to college in the fall. She previously didn't know what she was gonna study. She didn't even really wanna go to school. Her mother was making her go and she was like, oh, I don't know what I'm gonna study. Now she knows, now she knows about her sexuality. She knows what really drives her and what gets her excited. Now she's directed to study criminal justice. I think readers would like this book because it's a wonderful escape. I've created a young, absolutely heroic protagonist with a lot of fears and insecurities that she overcomes through the process of finding the truth and bringing a crime syndicate to justice. Wow. Um, thank you for that read. It sounds like an engaging read. It sounds like definitely something that would have a lot of wide appeal for young people. But we'll thank turn you. that over to the judges. Okay. I'd love to be able to start. This is Joylyn M. Ross with Path to Publishing. I'm just going to go back to how Stephanie started us off, really being able to be in that process, having been an acquisitions editor for a decade and not really being with the authors, with the writers in this stage. Lisa, that was so fascinating. I literally felt like your co-author here. I'm sitting here like, oh my goodness. I was so engaged as an acquisitions editor. That's what we want. That's what we want to hear. We don't want the appetizer. We don't want the teaser. We want that full course meal. And that's exactly what you gave us. You walked us through the entire story with nothing to guess. So definitely from the acquisitions editor in, that's what I would be engaged in. That's what would make me say, okay, give me the first three chapters. Then if I'm in love with those first three chapters, give me that full thing. And then give me the manuscript. Here's the offer. From a reader's standpoint, people may think, oh, that's way too much. But if we're talking outline, this is what we want. We don't want to have to guess what's going to happen. What is your thought process? And if you just did that in 10 minutes. I can only imagine what you're going to do with that dedicated, committed, carved out time. I know I'm complimenting you and judging you on the process more so than the content, but as literary artists, as creatives, as content creators, that process is the foundation of literary success. So kudos, someone else can judge you on the other portions and the other pieces, but I just had to unmic and let you know your process of this and really thinking this out is, it's phenomenal. So kudos, Lisa. Thank you, Joy Lynn. I appreciate your insights. Awesome. Yeah, speaking of someone who doesn't do outlines or synopses, unless you absolutely force me to do it, I'm in awe of what everybody is doing here tonight. Yeah. I really, really think you guys are amazing. That said, Lisa, you said this was going to be about 86,000 words, I think. Yes. I just don't know how you're going to pack all that into a fairly short novel because, I mean, you've got a lot of stuff going on in there. And each one of them sounds interesting, but I think each one of them could be a novel in and of itself. So I'm wondering if, if this is actually a trilogy that you're starting rather than a single novel because you've just got so much stuff going on there. It sounds like you've got a, enough material to do several books. 
Thank you for that, Pat. I didn't think of this as a series. The book is done and I've done three edits of it. I've had two beta readers so far. In my next iterations of it and also sending it to a sensitivity reader, I'll have to see, does this feel like it's too much? But it's definitely a thrill ride. It's definitely for thriller readers who like a complex, multi-layered plot, but deep meaning at the heart of what's going on with this character. What all of you are asking us to identify is why would a reader care enough mm -hmm. about this character to pay $16.99 or $18.99 or whatever? We have to make them care about the character. So thank you, Pat. All right, Rose, you want to give us some feedback for her? Right. Yeah, no, actually, um, I was agreeing with what everyone had said earlier, and I had some thoughts in my head, and I didn't write them down, and it um, flitting right out of my mind. There is the complexity to it, but I think you probably can bring it all home. What I really did like was your confidence and how you have laid it out. I, I totally agree with, with that because you're in control of the idea. You know what you're doing. You, you can bring it all back into a cohesive story. I really do like that. And it is also more diverse than some of the books that I see and some of the manuscripts that I get. In fact, maybe most of them, I do really like that too. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So the next author we're going to pick on is Dr. Mike. Can't wait to hear what you've got going for us. Like I said, I had finished my novel last week and finished the beta reads, went off for final publishing, comes out in a couple of weeks. And so my head was kind of empty. So I took this challenge very literally and my notes, I'm going to be reading these, but I've been thinking about this one for a little while, and I think it's time to start on it. The name of the book is The Deathbed Confessions of Harry Beach. Harry's completing his life sentence. He's dying. He's been assigned to be interviewed one more time by the FBI. And they assign a little probie from the FBI because Harry is a lifelong convict. He's been serving a life sentence, <clears throat> and as they always do when it's time and these convicts die, they have a chance to wind up other investigations that have not been solved before. And so they look for deathbed confessions or clues from people that have held their peace. Tom Quinn, who is the young probation officer, is sent there to interview him. And Harry Beach is a fine old man. He's on dialysis, he's on a unit, he's there next to the breathing machine and the machine that goes ping. And Tom sits down with him and starts asking him his questions. Harry Reid will not speak with him. And he won't speak with him until he turns off the tape recorder. Once he turns off the tape recorder, Harry Beach opens up. And so the book itself will be a series of chapters, each one detailing a story that Harry Reid tells to the young Tom Quinn. But the young Tom Quinn also has problems of his own because it's not just the police that are interested in the answers from Harry Beach. And so Harry Beach sends him down a road of discovery and growth and everything else. At the same time, he's reflective and philosophical, and he tells both the criminal episodes, but he also talks about his life regrets. And he takes it upon himself at the last minute to educate this young man about what it really means. And the two become friends. And Tom Quinn goes to his funeral alone. Oh my God, I am a host, but I just want to say, wow. Every time, Dr. Mike, every time you find a book, that's just the main. I'm sorry. So there we go. That's the idea anyway. And I just thought, what the heck? I'll try it. Judges, I haven't heard from Stephanie in a minute. So Stephanie, do you want to well, weigh in? I'm on right here and I was sitting on the edge of my seat. You know, I'm loving hearing from authors. And, and quite frankly, Mike told us the least about 
of what actually happens in the book. And yet I was sitting on the edge of my seat because I, I mean, first of all, Mike, I hope you do the audio also because your delivery is outrageous, outrageous. Oh my gosh. I'm just sitting there and you had paused. You'd paused. I'm like, what happened? What did he say? Oh my gosh. Right? Right? When it was like, he's just so good. Um, so yes, these characters, you got across, you know, that classic show don't tell thing. Oh my God. You just were like a classic episode of that. I feel these characters. I want to know, I want to read the book. I have no idea what your book is about, by the way, because you didn't actually tell us. Except I love these characters. And I'm just like, wow, what a delivery. What a delivery. So, yep, I'm, I'm engaged. I want to read the book. AMA, Deborah Franklin, either of you want to speak one more time for the judges before we move on to the guest judges? I and am getting ready to jump right in here because I felt like the whole silence of the lamb kind of situation. Yes, I was exactly. getting ready. Yeah. I was jumping in there and all I, all I kept hearing was, yeah, Clarice, you know. But <laughs> I just knew he was going to say, John, I have something. And then it was like, you're sitting there and I was so excited because I have to agree, your voice, your annotations, your having the pregnant pauses, that's what really brought me into the story. I was like, I want to know more. I want to hear more. Cause I could start to see the character. I could see the guy on the deathbed. And once I get a visual, I'm excited. I'm ready to go. I really like the whole showing me and not telling me because that's something that sometimes authors do have a problem with, but you definitely jumped right in and showed us everything. And I appreciate that. Anyone want to say? Thank you. Two? Thank you. Two sentences in from the judges because we're moving on to the guest judges. I do love stories that are novels built from short stories, mm -hmm. Mike. I think that that just is a wonderful premise for what you're presenting. It's a very exciting idea. Joy, Lynn, or Pat? Yeah, I also got Silence of the Lambs with the first sentence or two, but then backed <laughs> off from that as you were telling us really what this was really going to be about. I'm glad that it's not going to be Silence of the Lambs. But I do also agree that if this is a series of stories, then that gives you a lot of room to build on a lot of ideas and themes and people. So you've given yourself a real opportunity to open this up in very unexpected ways. I think that would be something that any reader would be interested in seeing. I thank all the judges for their input. As a host, I'm in love <laughs> with this book. I'm in love with everyone's book idea. I'm definitely in love with your delivery. We're putting it back to our co-host, Brandy, and she's going to introduce our last contestants, and then it's deliberation time. Yes, indeed. It is John R. Kyle. Come forward, because we are ready to hear your story. Okay, I'm impressed by everybody. I hope that mine is not terrible. You guys have all had some great stuff. I really like y'all's ideas. This is actually for a sequel, but I'm writing the sequel right now, so this would be for that. Zenith lives in an overwrought world divided into three classes, productives, consumers, and useless. Religion, known as relics, are banned publicly due to 100 million people dying due to religious zealots blowing up a metropolis. An eyepiece called the ocular everyone must wear is regulated by the government to watch your whole life and determine your productivity. These rankings are compiled in what is known as the Merit Thon, which determines healthcare, who can drive a car, be in government office, and other and many other things. Zenith cannot wear the ocular and is ostracized as a suspicious outcast, with sporadic beatings included. After losing his anorexic sister, his mother due to an overdose, and his grandmother, he can no longer bear life. He feels he didn't do enough to help his sister or his mother as he watched his sister slowly wither away from anorexia. His grandmother taught him a relic, a spiritual belief that can only be spoken to a direct family member. No secular texts exist to spread the relic's message. Despite this, Zenith's despair and resentments overcome him, and he sells his soul in exchange to gain unnatural powers of fire, and also an apparition which is a soulless monster that exists in the soulless side. 
uh, instead of the human world. So that apparition now shares his soul. Zenith finds aid from Ethereal, the supernatural woman who offered him the contract to begin with. She has been on the soulless side for centuries, awaiting evil periods where she could make her contracts. By chance, Zenith also befriends and saves the life of Tuttle Swift, a hacker and addict who has no purpose in life. These characters, each not very trusting of strangers, form an odd alliance to aid Zenith, whose only salvation is to defeat the Prime Three, the oldest and most wicked of all the apparitions. To fight tremendous evil, Zenith himself must bring evil closer to him. In order to gain power for his apparition's flame, he must kill, and his apparition has a taste for innocent souls. Alas, with each life he takes, Zenith's apparition grows stronger and becomes a, resent a relentless voice in his head, whispering demented ideas and advice. The stronger the apparition gets, the less control Zenith has over his actions while under the apparition's influence. Zenith, just like Ethereal, is a hybrid apparition because he shares his soul with an apparition, the difference being that Ethereal never signed a contract. Zenith did. Society ostracized and denigrated Zenith because he was a peculiar, which meant that he couldn't wear the ocular. Zenith must defeat each of the prime three without losing his humanity, despite society trying to hide the disappearances that are being caused by the apparitions. The power he must gain is the very power that could consume his soul and make him a permanent apparition. His friends and spiritual entities help cage the beast so that Zenith is able to defeat the prime three in the end. And that's about all I got. Thank you, John R. Kyle. Okay, judges, guest judges, what are your thoughts? Can we at least get three people to weigh in on this? It feels to me, John, it's a little similar to what I felt about Wolf. The synopsis was presented almost backwards. I, I think there were so many very interesting ideas, but it sounds to me like what you're actually going to be focusing on are the apparitions, soulless, the contracts, Zenith trying to save his humanity in spite of the prime three. There's a lot of spectacular stuff going on there, but the synopsis began with the productives, consumers, useless. While I can imagine that would be part of the underpinning of your world in terms of world building, I would recommend not starting your synopsis that way because I think it distracts us as mm. listeners, this, at least it was my experience, from where you're actually going and from what is really the interesting heart of your story. Okay, that makes sense. I appreciate that. Tammy, excellent. Thank you for uh, putting that really coherently. It's it's now a little after 1 a.m. and I'm getting fady. <laughs> oh but um, I, I think that really does, because um, I think, um, and I heard that in Wolf also, but yes, what you've done is you're setting the scene, John, and you're telling us the, the, the place that Zenith is coming from. This is the society he's growing up in. This is where he is. This is what the, the challenges he faces on a daily basis. He can't do the normal things. He can't do this. He can't do that. He's He's been watching everyone he loves lose, you know, lose their life. And he feels as if he's let them down. But the, the this is the backdrop. This is, this is like where he's, where he is. This, this is where he is. And then you go on from there. So I do believe that you would want to focus more on um, the story is about this young man doing this, 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 his background is blah, blah, blah. If you, if you get to that. Um, but it, it's not um, like you wouldn't have it on the back cover. You know what I'm saying? You would probably not do a whole lot of that on the back cover. You'd be saying uh, Zenith finds himself in a situation where he's aligned himself with these, with these toxic and dangerous forces because he's trying to solve this problem and, and do this sort of thing without telling people too much. But I think that you, you probably wouldn't put the background on the back cover so that's the kind of thing that is discovered as you go through and and the other mistake people make is they tell us everything he was born and these things happen and then happen and then he turned eight and and you know by that time i've died you know and so um i usually tell people okay take the first few chapters off and then we can go forward so um you, you want to kind of start in the middle almost you know and and start going on from there that would be okay. my that would be my impressions thank you very much i appreciate it but good ideas i like it i like it <laughs> Thanks. Little, little male, maybe. Yes, judges? Joy Lynn? 
You were real quiet for a long time, Joylyn. Well, you know, look, I when I turn my camera off, I'm getting popcorn. I mean, that's a good thing. I was like, you bad girl. It's nice well, to know that we're in that entertaining Joylyn. I'm like, this is really good. But I mean, I agree. A lot of great concepts there. But what really hit me and really sparked me and really pulled me back in, and I'm sure it will be the same way for most of us who are more character driven, is when you just said the line without losing his humanity. Um, it has the, the, the good versus evil, the typical, which is what we need. And you want to cover that. You want to brill it in a little bit. But that is when you really hit me and you really pierced me as a reader is without losing his humanity. We really want to focus on that and not make it just something that you slide over. It's really a big part of the story. And I'm sure is that has a lot to do with the character arc as well. So just to bring that out a little bit more, but yeah, back to my popcorn. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Erlyn. <laughs> I appreciate it. We're down to the time where everybody has okay. gone ahead and presented. Brandy, I believe you're going to tell the judges what they're doing next. For the next five minutes, judges, you guys will be conferring and deciding who you're going to declare the weakest link. Now, they're not going to be eliminated today, but you're going to give them advice on what they need to work on to improve so that when we come back next week, they're ready to win. Judges, if you don't mind going ahead and muting your mic, yay, because we're going to go ahead and talk to our contestants. Brandy's going to go ahead and interview them and see how they felt that they did this week. <laughs> yes, I am. All right. So again, I will start with Wolf. Let's pick on you. How do you feel you did this week? What do you feel is going to be the result after you're done? I think... The round reflected my confusion. That may just be growing pains. Because Nona said in her email, outline. When I hear outline, I, I think of exactly what Lisa did, a beat sheet. But then it turned into synopsis somewhere. And to me, that's something completely different. Again, there are different theories on this, but a lot of people say, well, okay, I shouldn't say, it, but what I heard from especially the first two judges wasn't about synopsis, but about a pitch, which again has a completely different structure. And there is a school of thought that a lot of the judges followed that the pitch should emphasize the character, the main character. In fact, by that standard, I used way too many people in my synopsis because it wasn't a pitch, it was a synopsis. I don't think there was general agreement about what this exercise was about. Because if, if you really do an outline, which is essentially like what Lisa did in a beat sheet, that focuses on the plot. That is the whole point of a beat sheet. It doesn't focus on the character. Oh, great. I shouldn't say that. There is, of course, the internal conflict that can also be incorporated into the beat sheet. But the classic Save the Cat beat sheet is about plot. It's not about the character. So we were basically miscommunicating as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Well, thank you for that critique. All right. Next up, I will ask Miss Lisa, how did you feel how this episode went and what's your expectation for next week? I learned so much today. Wow. Hearing from all of you literary professionals in kind of different areas and hearing what's important to you, considering what I imagine your desks look like, all of the manuscripts that you go through, this is absolutely golden that as authors, we can hear from you about what you look for, what, what shuts down your interest, what really grabs you. And I've taken a lot of notes today. That is just so valuable. Hey, I think I did okay with my pitch. I want to keep kind of refining it. I'm going to use the feedback that I got for 
next time. I really came away with something interesting for Deborah when you mentioned how we come across to the media. That's so critical for us as authors. I'm sure readers and industry professionals would be asking how and why I understand the LGBTQ experience enough to write about it. I'm a straight white woman and my character is mixed race, a young adult teen. That diversity foundation of the story is stretching me as an author. And that's going to be kind of one of the things that I have in the back of my mind too. It's challenging it's challenging to craft a character in the most realistic, sensitive, and relatable way for modern contemporary readers. I'm learning a lot. That's great feedback. Thank you. All right, Dr. Mike, it is your turn. I'll ask you the same question. How do you feel this episode went? And what are your expectations for next week? No, I didn't have any preconceived notions or anything like that. I'm kind of surprised at what I put down on paper here. I like the fact that for me, when I write, it's important that I feel it. When I'm writing, I want the person who's reading it to feel the emotion that I'm trying to convey on paper. I want the person to have some depth. And considering that I did literally just take 10 minutes and write this down, I kind of like the way it came out. And so win, lose, draw, whatever, I, I think I'm going to want to write this. And so I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to the experience because for me, it's, a, you know, I laugh, I cry, I sweat in my underwear and everybody gets to feel what I feel when I'm writing it. It looks like I'm in for some fun. This has been fun. And I got to say, I'm so impressed with everybody here. You guys are so classy. Thank you for including me. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Mike. And last but hardly least, Mr. John R. Kyle, why don't you tell us how you felt this week went and what your expectations are going forward? Uh, it, it was eye-opening, you know, to hear. I, it's rare that I get to talk to people who've, you know, published books or have awards or anything like that, let alone the people who, you know, uh, their job is to find books that can sell and, and people will like. So it's interesting to hear what they're looking for. I'm writing a sequel now, but it's just for anything. It's good to know, like, you wouldn't put this on the back of the book. And you got to, like Joellen was saying, focus on the human element. I'm glad that in my book, definitely the human relationships play a big role. But I'm happy to be here because somebody who's never written something before, or th that was published at least, it's just good to know kind of experts talk about what they see, what people see, and how you need to do things if you want to put your best foot forward so that maybe you can get one of these works and projects out there one day. It's been very enlightening on my end. Awesome. Thank you for that feedback. That's nice. All right. We'll know to... All right, you guys, I now have an actual winner over here. But before we pick out our actual winner, I would like for the judges to tell us who they thought when they were picking, who at least were their top two or just who came to mind immediately and why. So we're going to start with who answered me first. Stephanie answered me first. So there you go. <laughs> sure. Loved hearing from everybody and everyone's take on it was so different. But in a way, feeling that Lisa gave me the book that was really fleshed out and well thought out at this stage. Some books sounded like they still had some work to go, but I really felt as if for the outline, that one really showed me the what, the why, the who, the where, everything about it. I really came away knowing who that ideal reader would be for that book too. So I'm ready to kind of market it too, which is really the whole picture. So thanks. Deborah Franklin. Who did you pick and why? I thought everyone did an awesome job. And I have to agree with Wolf because my background is in education as well. I can understand how everybody has their own definition of what's going on. It's really kind of hard for me to pick a winner because for me, I told you what I was looking for. I like voice. I like people that can come on. They're confident about what they're doing. I didn't, like, I didn't even know what was, like, you didn't know what you were, you know, like, this wasn't something brand new. So for me, I would have had to choose Dr. Mike because you pulled me in. I like the characters. I like what you were doing. I like that if I had to book you for a media event or somebody was coming, that you 
actually sold your book and it's not even a book. You know, you had me wanting to go, wait a minute, where is, can I go on Amazon and find it now? Or do I, can I go into audiobooks? That's why that was, that would be who I would have had to go with. But I do agree with Wolf that clarity is a beautiful thing. And if we all were on the same page, then we really could have had that checklist to go down and say, nope, you missed that. Other than that, that's it for me. Okay, our next person is Pat Valdata. Who do you feel did the best? You can tell us who you felt did the weakest as well, but also why. Oh, well, here's the hard part for me. Normally when I do a contest, I've got a stack of manuscripts and several weeks to go through them and I'll narrow them down and narrow them down and they'll have my top two and I will waffle back and forth and back and forth until the deadline. And then whoever I'm waffling toward that day is the one who comes out on top. So this is really, really hard for me to do because everybody was so different. Lisa was obviously really prepared and thorough and had that whole outline down pat. Mike has a really thought provoking concept that was really, really interesting to me. So I can't do better than a tie mm. and say they both come out on top. I'm a Libra, so I've got to understand how hard this is for me. I just can't do any better than that. That's what I'm thinking. Don't worry, it's not a tie on this side, so you're good. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Joy Lynn, who did the best and the worst for you and why? Like I put, when I actually unmiked for the first time, I said, I'm a little confused. Are we doing the four course meal, which is the outline, or are we doing the appetizer, which is the synopsis? And so I was told we were to be judging an outline. And the outline is the full story. It's not the appetizers. You don't leave us guessing. That's something you do for the synopsis and the reader. And outline, what did the young kids say today? Lisa understood the assignment. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to go with that because again, I was told that we were judging an outline. And so that's what I was looking for, the full thought process, not the teaser, not the appetizer, not the, ooh, that makes me want to buy the book off the shelf. That's the synopsis. So for me, it would have to go to Lisa, who understood the assignment and got it. Hey, M.A. Sullivan, who do you think did the best and why? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I will say that I'm interested in all four of the stories. Mm. I, uh, all four of them have things that are that I want to know more about. Um, but uh, I think, unlike Joy Lynn, I'm I'm gonna say, what are the two books? That just based on what I've heard just from tonight, what what are the two books I'd go pick up? And it would absolutely be Lisa's and John's. Uh, I heard the most in both of those um, synopsis, which it's, it's yeah, we're, we're still wondering <laughs> what exactly we're listening to. But in terms of what was offered for the story, um, you know, both Lisa's and John's offered engagement of different kinds, which is very interesting to me. So, you know, like with John's world building, uh, multifaceted, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes here, multifaceted, good versus evil, personal stakes, it was all there. Um, I did feel Lisa's was the strongest and I was engaged in so many ways, intellectually with the puzzles and the gaming, kind of physically, I could feel the fear and the chase and the danger. And then emotionally with the coming out and the, and the relationship with the mother that had to be negotiated. So I, for me, it was Lisa and John's, I would, I would order those audio books right now, <laughs> based on what I heard tonight. And lastly, we have Rose Drew, and I'm sorry I made you stay up so late. Rose Drew, who is your strongest and weakest and why? Right. It's okay. First of all, I have to say, Lisa, you're right. My desk is cluttered. In fact, it's a fire trap. Yes, it's got manuscripts everywhere. I was laughing when you said that. As far as the strongest, I was there with someone said they wanted to do a tie. I'm like, yes, <laughs> because for me, it would be Lisa who who really did do the, the full outline and let me know exactly where she's going to go from A to B to Z. And Mike's who's got this heart and I just really want to read the book. So you have to write it, Mike, please. I'm waiting now. I'm going to give you a month. 
because you apparently write quickly. But anyway, I would say, and if you carefully noted, you keep asking someone to give you the weakest and we all just not going to do that. We just, all of us have completely ignored that because I, I don't want to, I don't, I don't think anybody here was weak. I think everyone here has an idea that they have in their mind hammered out and decided what they want to do. They've got a beginning and a middle and, and world building. Exactly. In this book festival I'm putting together, there's, there's someone who's got a whole series of books on world building, which is fascinating. So there's actually world building in every book you write, or there's no book, but the, the amount of technical thinking out that is involved in all four outlines is very much there. Lisa's, I do believe, is, is the one that is exactly put together and is something that I could market and I can see it going and reaching into a lot of hands. And Mike's is the book I want to read. <laughs> so I, I'm going to tell you that's kind of it. As someone who wants to get books into hands and sell them and stuff like that, it would really be almost a tie between those two. But as far as the other ideas, I think you guys really have something that you're going on with. And I really wish you all well. Yeah. And, and if I could just jump in and say, I totally agree with, with Rose. And, and anybody who knows me knows if there was a weakest link, I would definitely let you know. But with John's, I went and got popcorn. So I'm trying to see the movie. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> exactly. <what I'm> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, you guys. So that means that we have come down to our final moments. And our winner officially is Lisa. Since there is no weak writer among us this week, we have no warning. Although I will warn you that next week, there will be no such thing. It will be an elimination. I want to thank everyone today for being part of the first author reality show for this audio section. And I cannot wait to see who is actually going to win that contract in week four. Also, I want to let the publishers and judges here know that on week four, if you find a book that you feel that you want to jump in, you can do a competing contract with the contract that's actually being offered. Yes, and the author can turn you down for the contract that's being offered. So that's up to the final decision, it's up to the author. I am excited for week four. Brandy, any closing words before I go ahead and do our whole last line shtick? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I just wanna thank everyone for being part of this incredible dream that we have had for so long of getting a writing reality TV show going. and. Good luck writing over this next week. Writing, so much. Reality, writing reality is hard, but it's the reality of writing that we'll be seeing next week.